Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a physicist, and I would like to tell you my dreams. But before doing so, I would like to recall what happened last year. It's this colossal failure of modern technology. My thoughts go out to people whose lives have been disrupted. When the earthquake struck, I was working at the Kabri IPMU on Kashiwa campus. The director of Murayama declared the institute be closed for one week. So I went, went back to Caltech. There, I organized, we organized, excuse me, I and my friend at Caltech organized a public talk by an expert of nuclear sa safety, translated slides into Japanese and distributed them over internet. We also raised funds for disaster relief. But I felt powerless. I felt that my research is totally useless. What is the point of doing this research in the face of disaster of this magnitude? I would like to come back to this after telling my own research. So after all, I'm telling you my dreams. When I was a kid, I was impressed by the story of Hideki Yukawa, who uncovered the deepest secret of the subatomic world by the power of his pure thought. So I went to the graduate school of Kyoto University to study elementary particle physics. It was in 1984, which turned out to be a fateful year for me. The superstring revolution was a game-changing event. This was great because a whole new frontier opened up, and even the first-year graduate student could be a front runner. It was exciting since we might have found, stumbled upon the final theory. But of course, the word final or ultimate have been abused too much these days. So I'd like to explain what I mean by this. The purpose of my life is actually to find out the most fundamental laws of nature. Suppose we are like this matryoshka doll. We humans are all made of cells. This is another failure of modern technology. <laughs> Oops, I'm giving out the punchline. Okay, so. I, I had the atoms there. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to blame anybody. So, we are all made of cells. Cells are made of atoms. Atoms are made of electrons circling around its nucleus. Each nucleus, nucleus is made of the protons and neutrons combined together by Yukawa's mesons. And the protons, neutrons, and mesons are all made of quarks. You see, we have this much. So you can ask, what are the quarks made of? But you can ask a better question. It's a meta question. Will this march towards the fundamental laws of nature goes forever? Or will it end somewhere? Is there such a thing called the final theory, the most fundamental laws of nature that govern the whole universe? I tell you the answer. There is a final theory. The human's historic march towards fundamental laws of nature will end. To explain this, I'd like to tell you how we look into small world. We can use an optical microscope to see things at the scale of tens of millions of meters. The Large Hadron Collider at the CERN laboratory is the largest 
and the most powerful micro, microscope we have. We can, it is a big machine whose circumference is 27 kilometers. We can use this machine to look at things at the scale of tens of quintillions of meters. At these accelerators, we speed up elementary particles like protons and electrons and collide them together. When they collide with large energy, new particle emerges. And we build particle detectors to collect them and reconstruct what happened at this small world. This is the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider. They gave us a tour of the facility just before they closed the area and started the experiment. And this is actually my daughter standing <laughs> in front of uh, this uh, gigantic detector. I really felt like looking at the modern day version of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So, can we build even a bigger accelerator with more energy and look at small world? Well, this gentleman says that there is a limit to it. Albert Einstein said that energy is equivalent to the mass. So if you build an accelerator with large energy, the energy can be converted into the mass and generate gravitation. If you build an accelerator whose energy is too large, the energy is too large, the mass is too large, the gravitational force is too large, and the gravitational force would collapse the space into a black hole and the fabric of space and time is torn apart, and we will not be able to see what's inside of this small scale. This is the end of the short distance frontier. The theory that describes this scale should be the final theory. So the final theory exists. Of course, it is not clear if the human, we, are intelligent enough to be able to discover this law. However, in 1984, we stumbled upon a very promising candidate. We may have found a final theory. Actually, to tell you the truth, this, phrase, this theory is crazy. It said, a theory, it said that everything is made of strings. We think that we live in three dimensions with height, width, and depth. But this theory says that space has nine dimensions, six more than what we have. Where are they? It says that gravity is an illusion. But this is crazy. We feel that every day. It says that space itself is an illusion. No wonder we can't tell whether we are in three or nine dimensions. This is totally nuts. But I think that does any theory is that can be a candidate for the final theory should be this much crazy to be right. But we cannot, I cannot explain this in 10 minutes, so I wrote a popular <laughs> science book, <laughs> which I already encourage you to buy. It's a great book. <laughs> in fact, uh, I think that the gravity is a mysterious force, but it's actually a very important part of the fundamental laws of nature. And to understand our universe, we need to understand the gravity. One of the things I found fascinating about superstring theory was that it says that uh, the mystery of our, our world is hidden in this sixth dimension. But it turns out that this sixth dimension is a very difficult thing. Not much was known about this. And it took me 10 years to develop tools to decipher this theory. Fortunately, I had these wonderful collaborators. And so we had lots of fun developing this tool, using them to make many discoveries. For example, we helped use, by our method, we helped solve the information paradox of Stephen Hawking. So, in the last 10 years, we have seen a great, great progress. In the last 10 or 20 years, we have, we have seen great progress in this theory. It has been a beautiful, it has been a parade of beautiful ideas and wonderful surprises. It has been a great ride. But then this happened. So I asked myself, what is the point of my useless research? So I'd like to tell you what I think about it now. First of all, I think many people would agree that fundamental discovery in science have prof made a profound, profound dividends to humanity. Practically everything we touch 
in our everyday life has been developed or improved upon by science. And moreover, healthy progress in science requires di diverse portfolio from foundation to applications. There are many examples of innovations where basic research, many, many examples of innovations that come from basic research out of pure curiosity without any practical aim. For example, the web browser was invented at the Sun Laboratory where this Large Hadron Collider is located. The researcher there needed a tool to exchange information efficiently, so they invented the web browser. Now, uh, Dr. Ataka is here from Yahoo, and he's going to uh, speak after me, and I hope he will not mind if I say this. If there were not these single-minded research at, by research at CERN to discover fundamental laws of nature, there would have been no internet commerce, no Yahoo, <laughs> no Google, nor no Amazon.com. But I would like to say more, actually. So I'd like to, I'd like to read a quote. And this is by Jean-Louis Chamot, who's the president of Caltech. That means that he's my boss. But I'm, that's not why I'm reading it. <laughs> While we cannot predetermine where scientific research will read, lead, we believe that true innovation comes when people can dream with freedom and focus. I think it's important that he said that dream should be with freedom and focus. He went on to say, I believe that this philosophy of encouraging curiosity as well as the pursuit of what may appear useless knowledge remains an advantage for the countries that need to be protected and nurtured. You see, she's saying that the pursuit of useless knowledge is of national interest of the United States. Does this country of Japan, which aspire to be a leader in innovation, are you willing and ready to take this challenge? Of course, we cannot tell for sure which useless knowledge will produce greatest dividends in future. But I can tell you this. The only tried and true compass is our curiosity to explore and understand this world. So I will continue to dream, but dream with freedom and focus. Thank you. <laughs>